Good morning. Good morning. My name is Paul Musgrave. I'm with the Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum. It's May 22nd, 2009, and I'm in Washington, D.C. I have the honor and privilege to be interviewing mm -hmm. Mr. Terry O'Donnell. Mr. O'Donnell, thank you for being with us. I'm delighted to do it. Thank you. Why don't we go ahead and start off with why, do you, why did you choose to go to the Air Force Academy? My dad was a 1928 graduate of West Point. Uh, he grew up in Brooklyn and was in the Army Air Corps and then the Air Force. And he was instrumental in founding the Air Force Academy as the Deputy Chief of Staff and Personnel, which was a three-star job. And he loved the Academy. I uh, took an interest in the military early on, being a military family, and was thinking of West Point, uh, University of Virginia, or Dartmouth. And he said to me, go wherever you want. And I knew he wanted me to go to the academy. If he told me to go to the academy, I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> but he said, go wherever you want. I'll support you. And I went to the Air Force Academy, and I was interested in flying. So that's how I ended up there. I want to ask a little bit about your father, because he, um aside from the Doolittle Raid, led one of the first uh, Air Force raids on Japan during the war. He did. He led the first B-29 raid on, on Japan and Tokyo. That's correct. And um, he had the honor of working for the legendary Hap Arnold in Washington for part of the war. And then he went back to the Pacific with the brand new B-29s. And he was a wing commander and out of Tinian and Saipan, they were going to bomb Japan. And uh, he did lead the first raid and then flew many other raids and uh, uh, you know, had a very distinguished uh, war career during, the, during that time. But, um, um, really a very fascinating time that I've studied and tried to learn as much as I can. My father didn't talk much about it, so I had to kind of dig it out from other people. But, uh, was quite an illustrious career. I should just say for the benefit of the people who will be indexing this interview later, uh, your father was Rosie O'Donnell. General Emmett Rosie O'Donnell. Uh, Rosie was his nickname that he got playing football at West Point. So. And where did you grow up? Well, we were a military family, but uh, my father was pretty senior when I was a youngster, and we didn't move as much as many. Uh, primarily Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio, March Air Force Base in Southern California, uh, Bowling Air Force Base when my f here in Washington when my father was at the Pentagon. And then he was promoted to four stars and went to Honolulu Hickam Air Force Base to head up the Pacific Air Forces. And it was um, during those years at Hickam that I uh, went through my uh, junior, sophomore through senior year in high school. What a wonderful place to go to high school Honolulu was in those days. And uh, I thought I had died and gone to heaven. It was fabulous. <laughs> you didn't go to Punahou by any chance. I went to Punahou. Did you really? I went to Punahou, yeah. yeah. Well, that's one thing that you have in common with, uh, with, the, uh, with the current the president, president yes. yeah, and Michelle Wee. And uh, Punahou has a lot of distinguished graduates. I, I don't count myself as one of them, but wonderful school. Looks like Stanford University sitting up on a hill overlooking uh, Honolulu. Just a fabulous place. And I was uh, uh, just honored to be a student at that, uni at that uh, school. One of our summer interns is also a very recent uh, alumna of Punahou. Punahou so. grad? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I had gone to a Jesuit high school freshman year in, in Washington called Gonzaga. And uh, my father said, we're moving to Hawaii. I said, gee, I don't want to go. I'm going to stay with the Reardon's family, friends of mine, and finish up at Gonzaga. And my father said, pack your bags. So I got out there, got to the beach. It was a co-educational school. Uh, I forgot about Gonzaga in about 15 minutes. I mean, I really did think that this was the greatest place in the world. And it was in those days, just fabulous. Yeah. You're at the Air Force Academy. You're in Colorado Springs. Right. What's the climate like at that point? This is 1962 through 1966. That's correct. That's correct. Well, it was, um, you know, the military training was uh, very much focused on the, on the Cold War. Uh, the strategic capabilities of the uh, Air Force, and nuclear and strategic capabilities were the subject of a lot of the military studies, of course, your primary job there is academic, uh, traditional academic college 
studies. Uh, the Kennedy um, assassination took place there. The Academy was on alert. Uh, it was a very um, uh, challenging, you know, difficult time for the country, I think, when that occurred. Um, so it was, it was really something that I had been living with as a military family. My father, you know, was a warrior in the Korean War and the, and the Second World War, and uh, we were still, you know, at war in the Cold War phase in a very heightened way during those days. So that's primarily what I recall. Uh, the Soviet Union and, uh, and uh, China were serious threats to the United States in our thinking and the way we looked at it. Um, and um, that was our focus. Mm -hmm. And this is a pretty hot time in the Korean War, you, the escalation in Vietnam, succession of Berlin crises, um, and of course you must have, just a few weeks after you begun, you must have gone through the 13 days, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yeah, the, um, that's, that's correct. Um, the dates don't, the dates escape me of that, but that is just correct. That's, that's right at the, uh, right at that moment. And um, so these, you know, these were, I think, among the uh, coldest of the Cold War days, you know, in the early 60s. Uh, you know, the Soviets had the, the uh, building enormous capability, nuclear capability and the like, missile capabilities. So at the Academy, we were very focused on those things, and uh, the purpose of the Academy was to train really airmen to, uh, to fight if needed uh, against the uh, whatever enemies the, company, the country had, but the focus was the Soviet Union and uh, what appeared to be at some point, you know, at that point almost an inevitable monumental clash with the Soviet Union, which fortunately never occurred. But that was our thinking at the time. That's what we were taught, you know. I just want to ask one question just to go back to Hawaii for a second. Um, Vice President Nixon has his 50-state campaign pledge in 1960. Uh, did you mm -hmm. go to his uh, rally in Hawaii? Um, no, because I just can't remember what the occasion was, but I did not. I did not. At that point, I would have been a sophomore in high school, I think, or a junior. I don't remember d going yeah. to the rally. No, no. Well, just given you know the the advanced school it would have been interesting if you'd been there from the uh, yeah from the outside. I would have liked to have been there I don't think I was <laughs> <laughs> actually I don't recall that visit to Hawaii I think it's the, just after the convention in '60 just um, after okay because okay. he kind of bookends it I think it's Hawaii and Alaska because he has to make the trip to Alaska right before election day oh yeah to get right. the 50th to get state the 50th in. state yeah um, his campaign managers probably would have him focus on another state at that time, but... <laughs> Illinois, Texas. Yeah, yeah, right, 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 right. Any of the other ones uh, at that point, I believe. Mm -hmm. You come out of the Air Force Academy, um, and uh, you go to law school. You're going to become a JAG officer. Right. You go to Georgetown Law. Um, when you come out, what's your first assignment? Well, as I said, I wanted to fly. Uh, when I graduated from the academy, I could not pass the flight physical. My eyes had gone downhill over the four years, and I was roughly 2100 vision. That's not good enough. And um, so they had a great legal department at the Air Force Academy and two mandatory courses. I took three or four courses. I was interested in the law and uh, got to Georgetown in the night school with OSI, Office of Special Investigations, in Washington being my, uh, my permanent assignment. So I started out as a, uh, an Office of Special Investigations agent, uh, ultimately in the counterintelligence area is where I wanted to be, and that's where I was when I went to Vietnam and served running uh, counterintelligence operations for the Air Force. And then when I completed Georgetown after a Vietnam assignment, then I went into JAG as a judge advocate officer. What was the Vietnam service like? Uh, it was a long year. I, uh, we ran uh, source nets with indigenous Vietnamese population around all of the Air Force installations to gather intelligence on when the, uh, the Viet Cong would um, 
come within proximity of the base, either with 122 uh, rockets or sapper attacks. They were always attempting to attack the uh, aircraft on the runways, on the air bases. And um, so, you know, you gather so much information. It's a perilous business intelligence because you get a lot of misinformation. The Army's, Army and Marine Corps had to go out to the villages to react to this information if we thought it was good enough and interdict the effort that was taking place there. Um, so it was, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a long year, and I traveled constantly within Vietnam to all the air bases because our source networks were run out of each base. You mentioned uh, off-camera, we were talking earlier, uh, that you were sent over as a JAG officer to the, uh, the CLC, the Cost of, of Living Commission, um, because you're not quite a lawyer yet. Yeah, right. I had uh, graduated from law school in 71, uh, June of 71, and taken the bar in July. You don't get, didn't get the results in those days to about November and uh, December, I believe. And I'm not sure when the Cost of Living Council was started, but as I recall it, the Air Force DOD was asked to send 50 lawyers. The Air Force got an allotment, and they said, well, we'll send O'Donnell because uh, we get credit for sending a lawyer, but he's not a member of the bar yet. He's waiting for his bar results. So I went over to the Cost of Living Council and, uh, you know, started work there. It was a very interesting uh, assignment. Well, I want to talk about this a little bit because the CLC was not only high profile, uh, but incredibly important. This is almost an American foray into central uh, planning of the economy. Right, right. What was it like to be, you know, a junior member, but, you know, a part of this? Well, it was always uh, puzzling to me because at the time I was much more aware and interested in, in politics, and uh, I had majored in political science and international affairs at the Air Force Academy, even though everyone has to, has to be a Bachelor of Science. We have to take all the math and science. So I was interested in these things, and I was taken back that uh, President Nixon found that this would be the best way to address the economic situation um, because it uh, did not seem to be something that was in accord with uh, either you know his history or his uh, pronouncements in the past or traditional Republican outlook toward the economy. So I was surprised, you know, when when it was set up. I was uh, put into a group that was dealing with. Uh, price control initiatives in uh, entertainment and hotels, and um, ultimately McKinsey Group was involved at the time, as I recall, providing guidance to us because I, I you know, had no expertise in hotels, but I participated in writing regulations uh, involving price, uh, hotel prices and uh, things of that nature which is a little scary <laughs> because I knew so little about it. But, uh, you know, we, got, we worked hard at what we were doing and tried to be fair and uh, accomplish the mission of the organization uh, at that time. I think anyone who knows the federal government will appreciate that you had to turn to private consultants to manage the economy. Right, right, uh, so. <laughs> right, right. Well, you, you, when you think about it, you're starting an agency out of uh, whole cloth with no history, and uh, to pursue something that this country had not done for a long, long time. I mean, you know, I, I don't know when, but maybe back in the Second World War there were certain initiatives along those lines, but um, so there was really no, no expertise in doing these things. And you had to start this agency, get up, get regulations and policies out there, and, and, and begin to enforce them. And uh, so it was a daunting task. It was interesting to be a small cog in that effort to see how it uh, unfolded. Well, you also had a vantage point of people who were big cogs in the effort and would later become, you know, a, a part of your life, a part of your career. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. I uh, met uh, Don Rumsfeld and uh, Dick Cheney uh, during those years. I was at, at very low in the organization uh, hierarchy, if you will, and therefore I didn't have any any substantial contact with them, but I met them, I knew who they were, and I, you know, uh, had an opportunity to exchange some comments with them, and uh, uh, D 
Dick Cheney attended some meetings that I was in at one point, so I have a recollection of that, but uh, no close relationship during that period of time. Do you remember anything that was particularly striking uh, from setting hotel prices? Just how difficult it was because uh, during the process we met with uh, people who really knew the hotel business, hotel proprietors, owners, hotel corporations, and um, they, uh, what one might think would be not too difficult to do because a hotel is a hotel after all. Suddenly, when, <clears throat> as you become educated, and this is so true in so many things in life, you find that it's not simple at all. It's hugely complex, and there are many, many moving pieces. And I, I remember just becoming frustrated at the effort that how could anyone, a government entity, purport to do this and, and to, uh, given the complexity of the economy and this industry, how could they purport to uh, deal with these issues? And. Um, uh, so that was my takeaway, is probably not a good thing to do in the long run, <laughs> you know, is to have uh, that kind of government involvement in, in, in industry. Uh, and uh, guess what? Here we are again, <laughs> you know, with the auto industry and the banks and, uh, you know, serious government involvement in, in private industry. Well, we've uh, interviewed uh, Vice President Cheney and Secretary Rumsfeld and also uh, Arnie Weber, um, who takes over, I think, in phase three of the, of the CLC. And right. uh, Professor Weber told us a story about setting prices for candy and how they were surprised to find that you had to have a different price for Halloween. Yeah. Which hadn't <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I didn't know that. <laughs> but I, I do think um, it just becomes so complex and, the, and then the challenge to be fair and equitable uh, because I don't think government really should be picking winners in, in, in an industry and losers by its regulation and by its policy. And it became very daunting to us to try to be fair and equitable, uh, given all the different types of hotels, the different interests, the geography, uh, the motel business, the hotel business. And I don't have a clear recollection of the details, but that was my sense of, of working on these issues. You're with the CLC for a few months, um, and then you get pulled into the White House orbit. How does that happen? <coughs> I, um, when I learned that I couldn't fly and uh, became a JAG officer, I, I was going to try that and see if that was uh, an interesting career for me. I decided I <coughs> would rather be on practice law on the outside. And um, I loved the Air Force, and I loved the training that I had at the academy. So I began to look around, and um, Alex Butterfield, who was a major in the Air Force when we lived in Hawaii and worked directly for my father as his military assistant, um, told me, and I don't remember why we discussed it, but he was aware, he was a family friend, Alex and Charlotte were, that um, the White House was uh, gearing up for the 72 campaign and they were going to be hiring some additional people and maybe you ought to go over there and just go through the interview process. So uh, not knowing what I was going to do next, I found that to be very interesting because I was always interested in government. And uh, so I went over to the White House and interviewed with uh, Ron Walker, Fred Malik, and Dwight Chapin and um, one or two others and ended up being hired onto the staff in around May of, uh, two th of 1972. And I was still in the Air Force uh, until the end of May or in June and then I became a civilian member of the staff. But I went over initially as an as a, as a, a Air Force member on the eve of uh, resignation. I had served uh, nearly six years uh, of a four-year commitment, so I felt that I had, you know, met my commitments to the Air Force and uh, was looking forward to serving in another capacity in government. That's how I ended up at the White House, really, with Alex's introduction. Where were you working at this point? Because you're not working for the committee, you're actually in the executive office. Well, I moved over. My first assignment was, uh, and you mean at the White House? Right. 
Yeah, my first assignment was uh, in Ron Walker's office. And Ron, as you know, was head of advance. And um, from May through the convention, I worked for Ron. So May to August or so. And I did advance work. And uh, I did advance work for the president, a uh, couple of trips for the president, and then, uh, then the first family uh, during the summer. So I did, did events for Mrs. Nixon to the big flood and uh, the visit up in North Dakota. I did, my first lead advance was the President Nixon's uh, visit to, uh, to Louisiana for Senator Ellender's funeral. And uh, I also was an assistant on the team at the President's visit to the Catholic Educators Conference in Philadelphia. Uh, when Mayor Rizzo was, uh, I, I think, uh, in, in, you know, mayor at the time. So I had some really interesting trips. I had a, um, took uh, Tricia to one of the uh, National River Park openings. It was supposed to be uh, Julie's event, but uh, ended up with Tricia and t uh, going down a John boat in the river. <laughs> You know, I'm not sure it was exactly what Tricia had, had, had thought about at the time, but uh, she was a great trooper. Um, I think boat so, ride down the Mississippi suggests something different. Yeah, yeah, this was a small John boat, you know, and, uh, and uh, Julie, I think, was sick, and Tricia came in to, to, to take the place and did uh, the uh, National Diving Championships with Tricia in Omaha. Um, so I had some really fascinating uh, trips during that period. Uh, before the convention, uh, working for Ron, went to the advanced school, which was a fabulous experience. And uh, Ron and his team had the uh, had brought advanced work in every aspect to a real science. I mean, they had studied it and uh, developed the manual and developed the, the practice beyond belief. And it was an efficient, effective machine to serve the president. You know, it was just terrific. I want to ask you a little bit about this because advanced work is interesting and it's not really been studied all that much but it's also I think particularly important to the way the Nixon White House worked um, because of the fact that you had news cycles coming together with a president who was very conscious of using you know his image of trying to shape the public debate so I guess I'll begin by uh, asking you to tell us a little bit about advanced school and about the advanced fans manual yeah, the school, I, the school, I believe, was conducted over a weekend. Um, it was very intensive. Mike Duval and Ron and uh, I think Bill Hinkle and a couple of other people taught the school. Um, it, uh, it was totally different than what I thought because it was more like a college course than it was, you know, typical uh, training or job training. There was a manual, you were supposed to read it and understand it. We discussed parts of the manual. There were many stories told uh, as examples, and it made an indelible impression on me. It was really well done. And uh, we learned how to you know, represent the president on the road and to ensure that the events were successful and that whatever message he had was properly, th that, the, that the setting was appropriate for the message. And um, uh, in a political context, that meant, you know, crowds and enthusiasm and things of that nature. Uh, in other contexts, it, it was what it was, whatever the message might be. International trips uh, were, were a very important focus because of the president's enormous leadership in the international arena. But also, um, uh, you know, domestic trips, political trips, and... Um, terrific group of people in my class, many of whom are still friends, uh, because they were recruited to uh, get ready for the camp campaign in 1972. And uh, at that point, wisely so, the president's team was preparing for a very aggressive campaign and extensive travel if the president, w if that was needed. Of course, as it turned out, uh, with the selection of George McGovern, uh, the uh, extensive presidential travel was not required uh, during the campaign. So, but we were ready for whatever might be required. And Ron was a terrific leader, just a great leader of that effort. So it was an eye-opener to me to, you know, well, 
like anyone who sees an event unfold and has really no idea how does this happen, <laughs> you know? And uh, uh, the amount of detail, work, uh, coordination, diligence, communication, combat, because there's a lot of give and take with local hosts and things of that nature, uh, creativity in, in making an event come off well. Um, it was an extraordinary thing. And of course, there was a long legacy of excellence around uh, Richard Nixon in this area, going back, you know, to uh, Bob Haldeman and, uh, and John Ehrlichman and um, so many of the, uh, of the, of the people who, who were so successful in substantive areas for President Nixon later had their beginning in the, uh, you know, in the advanced arena. And, uh, you learn an awful lot in going out and putting, making an event happen in a week uh, on the road, foreign or domestic. And so it was a great training area. I, I really enjoyed doing the work. Um, I'm curious, I mean, we've, we've talked to, you know, Ron Walker and Red Capney. Yeah, no, it's, it's fine. Um, we've talked to a, a number of advancemen, and it's, it's one thing to advance an international trip or a summit or a campaign stop must be something else to advance a funeral. Yes, I mean, you have to tailor all of, of course, you're not doing any crowd raising and things of that nature, and you, and you, you have to tailor it to, uh, to, to, the, uh, to the occasion so that the president's attendance and you know, his message, whatever it might be, if it's just paying respect to a, to an, you know, a former senator with an, an you know, outstanding record of service to the country. That was the mission there, and so we had to design everything to do that. So one, uh, you can't think about these things without telling one quick story. It was supposed to be exceedingly dignified and uh, appropriate to the occasion. And uh, Homer Luther, who was an advanced man um, and, and a wonderful guy, lives out in Wyoming, uh, was working for me on that advance, and he had Governor and Mrs. Edwards and we have been taught that you keep them away from the backwash of the helicopter. And um, I had met the president at the airport and was on the helicopter. And the helicopter, Homer wanted to have them at the ramp of the helicopter just on time. So he's there and he's ready to push them out, but he's, you know, the, there's too much. So he finally says, now, now, and so he goes and he calls it a little too early and there's still quite a backlash of, of helicopter of uh, wind from the helicopter, and uh, uh, Mrs. Edwards' uh, skirt flies up. <laughs> and just the thing you don't want to do. And I was mortified, Homer was mortified, and uh, you know, nothing escaped Bob Haldeman's vision, and he looks at that and you know, takes mental note, and I heard about it later. <laughs> this, was, this is not the way we do things, you know. This is a funeral, this was, and, and uh, but, uh, uh, in any event, the rest of it was very good. <laughs> the rest of it was quite appropriate. But uh, did you ever get a Haldeman memo? Like he had a, the famous uh, TL squared. Uh, I saw a lot of those, but I don't believe I was ever the subject of one of those. I mean, I did work for him for that period, intervening period of time. But uh, uh, no, I mean the. Every administration since President Nixon's has has endeavored to has learned from that advance uh, operation because they really discovered it and built it to to the state that it was uh, a science and an art, and everybody else has tried to do that in one form or another. And you have to because it's a complex world out there, and as a president moves around, things have got to be done right or a candidate. Otherwise, it becomes an enormous embarrassment. I'm thinking that uh, it's ironic that so many of the men who went through the Ron Walker Advance School in 72, preparing for what people thought might be a really arduous campaign, ended up applying those in s those lessons in 76. Yes. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. No. Uh, well, you know, the amazing thing about the Nixon administration was that it, uh, it was a uh, huge development pool for talent. I mean, a, uh, I think you, whatever anyone wants to say about the administration, you have to acknowledge that it was, it provided a talent pool that served this country well for 
decades a after uh, the administration and the term ended. And um, you know, the Ford administration was, was uh, you know, rich with talent that came from the Nixon administration. So was the Reagan administration. And so were the Bush administrations both. I mean, so it was a, uh, they had a very detailed process to develop that talent. It didn't happen by mistake, you know, and it was the president's call to establish that process and the strong White House personnel, the recruiting efforts and the like, and they did a terrific job. The president did a great job, I think, in identifying qualified people to serve, you know, in the cabinet cabinet level and on down. So and I can't leave a, a discussion of this without touching on one issue, and I'm just thinking back to Red Cavani. Did they, uh, did did Ron's briefing at any point touch on the dangers of hot air uh, balloon drops? Oh, we had a, uh, quite a, uh, I don't know whether it was a full chapter, but it was a very important area, balloon drops, <laughs> and, and how to do them properly and uh, how not to do them and the like. And um, uh, nothing was left unaddressed in that advanced school. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, we've seen uh, balloon flops and we've seen balloon drops. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a big difference, you know, and, and uh, but rallies, I mean, foreign advances were very, very challenging, but big political rallies were the best. I mean, I think that's what advanced men kind of really enjoyed doing. That's where all the creativity came in, you know, the bands and, and, and all of the setting to get, to get the people and, in the right mood for whatever the president was going to say, or the candidate's going to say, and uh, to make it a noteworthy event that the press would take note of and say, you know, and it would reflect people's views. You just couldn't pump it up out of nothing. I mean, but uh, there were people who were very, very enthusiastic, but you've got to get them there so people can see that because it sends such a message. And of course, things were so different then because you didn't have, you know, the cable stations and you didn't have, uh, you know, the instantaneous loop of news that you have now. So, you know, you had a story coming out of the day. Things were much easier and more defined. I think today's even more challenging in many respects because it's an endless loop. We didn't really live under that cir those circumstances. Well, I'm thinking about, because I think 2008 has set a new mold in some respects, the way the Obama campaign had internet, you know, two-way internet connection with some of its most enthusiastic and vocal supporters. Right, which right. Was a new development. It's a very new development. I mean, there've been a lot of new developments in, in the electronic age since uh, since our time with uh, with President Nixon. But uh, the people who master those uh, skills and technologies are are the people who who have a huge leg up. And uh, to the Obama campaign's credit, they did a terrific job of using electronic media, you know, for political campaign purposes fundraising purposes. I mean, they were hugely successful in that area. The election comes, President Nixon wins. Um, how do you end up working for Bob Haldeman? Well, I uh, started, as I said, I worked for Ron t uh, until the convention in August. In August, I was assigned to Dwight. And so I sat in the trailer, the control trailer, uh, you know, running errands and helping and doing the presidential box, you know, making sure that the right people were in the box at the right time, working with um, Dwight and Bill Carruthers, who was uh, a media producer. Uh, and then I worked for Dwight all the way through uh, from the convention until the election um, and attended the daily uh, meetings, the surrogate meetings. You know, we had a fabulous surrogate operation, just unbelievable, where we would um, get a speaker out there, you know, the day before to set the stage, and then the opposite, you know, McGovern would go in or one of his people would go in, and then we'd have a surrogate come in the day after. So we would sandwich all of those visits with our message. I mean, it was just really run well. And I saw all that and learned, you know, all that process working with Dwight and sitting in those meetings, sitting in meetings with, the, you know, the speech writers and uh, Dick Moore and uh, other advisors. Um, so that was a terrific opportunity. I really enjoyed working working for Dwight. He was a great person to work for. And then uh, at the election, I was uh, 
I was told that uh, Larry would uh, Larry Higby <coughs> would move uh, out of his office as Haldeman's assistant, and I would take that job, but Larry would stay in the West Wing and, and take on additional responsibilities. Ultimately, Dwight, of course, left, and Larry uh, was in, moved in the West Wing into Dwight's office, and I moved into Larry's office. And then I became uh, doing most of what Larry used to do for Bob, but because he was still there, he, Larry did the really I, I would say most of the key things, you know, because he never really fully left that role. But um, so from the election to uh, Bob Haldeman's resignation, I uh, served as his assistant in the West Wing. Now, this is an interesting period for you. Um, I believe that at some point you start setting up O'Donnell's Airline shuttling people back and forth. Between yes, indeed. David. Yeah, I mean, uh, right after the election, of course, uh, we went up to Camp David, and it was kind of a small core group. You know, Todd Hullen was with, with John Ehrlichman. Larry and I were with Bob, and then um, a couple of people, a couple of other people, military aides, and, uh, and uh, Ron Ziegler, and... Um, just a handful of people were up there, and the president had uh, asked for everyone's resignation uh, across across the government, and he began to consider restructuring his uh, cabinet and senior positions, and we flew to Camp David for interviews, a number of candidates for cabinet level positions and uh, very significant positions in government. And the president stayed up, um, you know, at Camp David with a couple of breaks for a good long time and conducted these interviews up there. One of my jobs was just to make the arrangements with the military office to get the uh, people up there and back and hopefully do it confidentially so that uh, rumors didn't permeate, you know, the town and, uh, and so forth. But it was... Uh, it was a, uh, a very interesting time, as I think the president reflected on the landslide election, and then you had the, uh, the uh, you know, the ticking problems of uh, of uh, Watergate that were, you know, starting to take hold. Uh, because I, I think, if I remember, that was a June incident. I started in July. Uh, uh, 72, so I was there about just about a month before the, the Watergate incident itself, and, uh, and of course, as history shows, you know, it continued to, to uh, gather steam throughout that period and uh, was uh, gaining more steam at the end of, uh, the end of 72, but hadn't hit the, the, you know, the high extreme levels, obviously, that uh, ultimately led to Bob and John's resignation, John Erlkman and Bob Haldeman's resignation. How old did you know Bob Haldeman? Well, I didn't know uh, as a member of the staff working for uh, Ron, I didn't see much of Bob except on the trip because he was always with the president. I were doing advance work for the president. Of course, Bob would be there, but I was way down the pecking order in terms of you know the organizational chain of command, so I didn't see much of him. Working for Dwight, I saw more of him because he was in a couple of meetings that I was in, but Dwight reported directly to Bob, and uh, uh, I wasn't in many of the meetings during the, during the uh, campaign itself. And uh, obviously, when I started working for him, uh, that was a whole new chapter, and I got to know him quite well, you know, during the uh, period of, uh, of uh, November through... I don't know, March or April, whenever the resignations recur, I don't, occurred. I don't remember the date, but uh, five-month period or whatever. And then I was, um, you know, with him constantly. I mean, I was taking notes when he would come out of a meeting with the president, you know, and it was my job to prepare action memoranda like Larry used to do to the staff that, of, of things that the president had agreed he wanted done or that Bob wanted done as a result of the president's instructions and uh, was up there at Camp David with him for a long time. So I got to know him quite well for a short period of months. 
what was your impression of him? Uh, I really like Bob Haldeman. <clears throat> I just tell you one vignette that sticks in my mind. Um, nothing escaped his view, so uh, he uh, walked into the West Wing one day through the lobby and something was out of place and a little sloppy. I don't know whether it was a pile of papers and magazines on one of the tables or something. I think that's what it was. And he, he, uh, he, he told me, he said, Terry, uh, I don't want to see that here. This is, the, this is the, the residence and offices of the President of the United States and it deserves to be run as a first-class operation in all respects. And um, so nothing escaped his vision, no matter how small. It just caught my eye. I mean, it's just I, it's something I remember, that he really expected things to, to be done right and properly and um, um, worked very hard to accomplish those ends. And this is leaving aside the, the whole Watergate issue and everything else. He was an extremely effective uh, leader and chief of staff. I think he served the president's interests uh, very well. And I'm leaving aside the, the Watergate business. Uh, he was uh, uh, very hardworking, uh, very, very diligent, detailed. He stayed out of the public limelight. His view of the chief of staff was to, you know, stay in the background, and, and uh, everything was done to uh, get the president's communications articulated properly and the president's message to the people and not, you know, FaceTime for the chief of staff or, uh, or things of that nature. So he was very uh, humble in that regard, you know. He just didn't, he wasn't looking for publicity. He wasn't looking for any kind of press coverage and things like that and uh, completely dedicated to the president and to the mission and really had a, a, a very keen view of the role of the president and uh, Bob I think was extremely patriotic. I mean he was very dedicated not only to serving Richard Nixon but to doing what was best for the country and uh, those are my views. Very smart, <coughs> extremely um, demanding. He expected your he expected everything you could do to, to be A-plus work and to push everyone, I think, to live up to their full potential, you know, and uh, was a tough taskmaster in that regard. I mean, he, he demanded uh, real performance. Um, so he was, um, I, I really enjoyed that, that period of, uh, of, you know, working for him and had a lot of respect for him. And, uh, you know, it was very sad to see things un unravel, uh, you know, in the, in the way that they did. When did you find out that he would be resigning? Oh, right, very close to the date. Um, I think, if I recall correctly, he called me in and, you know, said that, um, that uh, this was going to be the, uh, the best thing to do under the circumstances. And, but I didn't know, because that loop of communications about Bob had his own lawyer, who I know he was meeting with from time to time, and the loop of communications relating to the investigation and uh, the uh, Watergate issues were, were not part of our routine conversation. It was not things that he routinely would share with me. And, uh, you know, he might ask me to set up an appointment with his lawyer or something like that. But, but what happened within those meetings, he kept to, his, kept to himself. Um, so it was a, <clears throat> you know, it was a very tough time, I think, on the, on the staff because everybody coming off this landslide election, everybody, uh, was very upbeat about that, but this thing just kept ticking and would not go away, you know. And um, of course, the resignations were a big uh, milestone in the, in the whole post, you know, uh, Watergate history. After Haldeman resigns, you go to work for Dave Parker. Yes, I did. Um, uh, General Haig came in, and uh, he told me that uh, 
he said, Terry, I, I think you, uh, I've looked into you, you come from a good military family, so I'm going to keep you here on the staff, <laughs> which was a relief because you didn't want to leave the White House as a, as a lawyer and start knocking on the, on the door of a law firm in the middle of the Watergate uh, situation. It was not a good time to, to leave the White House, so I was delighted that uh, he would keep me on the staff. He, he did feel that there would be blowback. Uh, against Bob and, uh, and, and uh, Dwight, who I had worked for as well. So he said, I'm going to keep you on the staff, but I'm going uh, to send you over to the uh, EOB and, uh, you know, work for Dave. So um, I worked for Dave uh, from that point until the uh, resignation of the president in August of uh, 1974. So that was... Uh, April of 73 to August of 74. I worked for Dave. And at this point, do your uh, sp special assistant, staff assistant? Yeah, I was a, um, a staff assistant to the president and then I think a deputy special assistant to the president working for Dave, if, I, if I'm not, if, if, if I recall correctly, and then I became uh, special assistant to the president uh, when I took uh, the, uh, the job with President Ford. And we've talked to Dave Parker, um, mm -hmm. and so he's described his office and the way that worked. Uh, what was it like for you? What did you see when you were you know, trying to decide what appearances, what invitations the president would accept? Yeah, it was a... Um, our work... Uh, never stopped because the correspondence and the invitations and the planning never stopped, but the, uh, the amount of travel and the amount of events that the President did was moderated by circumstances. So uh, we would lay out, our job was to lay out very uh, detailed options, work with the Cabinet members and their assistants and White House staff to tie together whatever the message was, domestic or foreign policy, that he was trying to communicate with appropriate events uh, around the country or internationally, and then provide that menu uh, to uh, the president so he could select what, what if anything, he would, he, he would want to do. And of course, that would all go through um, the chief of staff's office. So um, Dave also was a terrific guy. He's a very good friend, and it was a wonderful guy to work with. And um, he's had a great career uh, outside of the White House, you know, and still and, uh, is really a leader in the association community in Washington and, and nationally. I mean, he's terrific. Well, one of the other legacies of the next administration is that I think at some point there were something like two dozen association leaders who were... Nixon veterans. Right, right, yeah. Not surprising. I mean, there were a lot of, there was an awful lot of talent, as I said before, yeah. So, one thing that uh, comes up is that you uh, advanced the president's return from the Moscow summit in 74, right? The Loring, Maine. Yes, I did. I, I went up and uh, I worked on that, even though I was in Dave's office. I did that, at that trip, and I did a uh, trip to the thumb of Michigan. Uh, which was a uh, motorcade through the thumb of Michigan on behalf of a, a fellow by the name of, I think, Sperling, who, who was a staff member and, and candidate for Congress up there, a Republican candidate for Congress. So I went out on a couple of uh, advances, even though, you know, I was not working at the advance office any longer. Hmm. But I did do the, uh, the rally there to welcome the president back from the, uh, from the trip. When do you first meet Jerry Ford? I um, met President Ford the day after he took the oath. Uh, General Haig, things were quite chaotic, as you can imagine. The, um, there was the small vice president staff. There was the Nixon staff. Pe things were unclear as to who was going to do what, who was going to stay, and who was not. Uh, right after the uh, 
the oath taking, there was a meeting in the uh, Roosevelt Room with senior staff. Uh, you may have heard about this, but um, you had the senior staff from uh, Vice President's staff and the senior Nixon staff there, and uh, everybody was in somewhat of a state of uh, shock, really, over what had happened in the last 24 hours, and uh, great uncertainty, and uh, very solemn, sober, and uh, the, so the group is gathering, and in bounces Tom Karologos, and he looks around the room, and he says, uh, hey, you Nixon guys, you're in serious trouble. Of course, he was, <laughs> he was the archstable Nixon guy. <laughs> he broke the room up, cut, you know, just uh, broke the ice, and uh, Tom was fabulous at doing that kind of a thing. I mean, it was a great comment. But uh, so Haig took me in and introduced me to the president, and he said, Terry, uh, he said, uh, Mr. President, Terry uh, is uh, going to work outside your office and uh, help me and you get things flowing properly within your office and your appointments and the paper flow system and uh, you know we'll, we'll do this for a couple of weeks and see how it works out. So uh, Haig had asked me to do that and I had been an understudy for Steve Bow a little bit so I, I knew generally what the job was. Uh, so I went down there and uh, uh, at General Haig's request help to impose the general system where you, ha you had to have an appointment to go in. Uh, papers should go through the staff secretary in order that things be staffed properly before the president uh, has to act on them and, you know, pretty basic fundamental things. As opposed to the hub and spokes. Yeah, well, as opposed to uh, the way a congressional office would properly run where the senior aides would just bounce in and out and uh, um, but that was still happening in the first uh, 24, 36 hours of the Ford administration, and uh, it was pretty chaotic. And uh, decisions were being taken in the office that affected policy, but they were not being properly communicated and not staffed properly. It was just a lot of little things all, were off on the wrong foot. So General Haig sent me down there to uh, work that process and make sure that you know we, we did have a disciplined system where the president would do whatever he wanted to do, but that it was on the calendar, it was scheduled, uh, that people didn't uh, interrupt him or walk in at the wrong time, and, and that they didn't bring in action papers that hadn't been staffed. You know, pretty fundamental stuff. So I went down there and did that, and uh, you know, <laughs> had to take some pretty tough positions with some of his longstanding staff members. But uh, ultimately, uh, I think the uh, process was set up. So uh, uh, Gerald Ford knew my dad, and like my father, they had played golf together really? uh, over the years, uh, periodically. And um, uh, we hit it off well, and after a couple of weeks, he said, <coughs> he said, uh, Terry ain't perfect, but we might, you might as well just stay, you know, and he laughed. <laughs> And so I stayed. I mean, he asked me to stay, so I stayed throughout the whole Ford term uh, doing what, essentially what Steve Bull did. Every president has a little different way of, of conducting that office, but that's what I did. Well, I want to get back to this in a second. Um, you know, I've done something that I was a lawyer. Um, I didn't know the answer to the question of when he first met Vice President Litter, President Ford. Um, I was wondering if, you know, in the advance, in the scheduling office, you'd actually taken any you know, role in scheduling the vice president during those last few months of the Nixon administration? Uh, yes, I mean, um, the, the vice president, Vice President Ford was asked to, to do a lot of things during that period of time, which is typical because you get, uh, you get very important invitations for the president of the United States that he can't do, and you ask the vice president to do it or a cabinet member. So we were in very close touch with his office about doing official events and, uh, and other events during that period of time. And, um, but I, I really had no personal contact with him. I mean, I had met him, I had said hello, but I, I had no personal contact during that period of time. I wasn't an advisor, I wasn't in his office in meetings or things of that nature. So the first time I really m met him for 
all practical purposes was when General Haig took me in uh, the day after he took the oath and said, uh, Terry's going to help you sit outside your office and uh, uh, we'll see how it works for a couple of weeks. So that's... Where were you when President Nixon resigned? I was in the East Room. Uh, I was uh, and uh, on the lawn, you know, when he took when he left on the helicopter. Yeah, very. Uh, uh, you know, very difficult circumstance, really, you know, for all the staff members. I think for the family and for him. I mean, it was a wrenching experience. Yeah. One question I haven't asked is that um, you're unique on the White House staff in that you actually had a family member. Um, only you and the Nixons had family members working in the White House. Yeah, we did. I didn't know how unique it was, but my brother Patrick, who was uh, uh, a special assistant to the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, uh, came over to the White House before I did and worked for Chuck Colson. And um, so he was on the Colson staff. Uh, and then I come in later, so we did have uh, brothers on the staff. I guess it is kind of unusual, really, to see that happen, but, uh, yeah. I think the Nixon administration had more O'Donnells working for it than Kennedy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah probably so, yeah, probably so. But, um, so I, uh, uh, you know, those, if I look back on the five years that I spent at the White House, I mean, I wouldn't have traded them for anything. They were fabulous. Uh, experience and um, two very different administrations, two different approaches, um, and being in the special assistant job, this personal aid job for President Ford uh, was an extraordinary uh, experience because you're with him really more than anybody. You're with him first thing in the morning, you see him off from the office eight or nine o'clock at night, whatever time he goes back to the residence and you're in and out of the office all day long and um, handling little things for him. I had no policy role at all, but bringing in the papers and interrupting them when there was an important national security event or, or important call and things of that nature, traveling everywhere he went, except Camp David when he was just there on the weekends, I didn't go, but every single political and foreign trip, Vladivostok and the Helsinki Accords and, and so forth. So. Uh, I understood what you know. Steve Bull had told me about that that being the most remarkable job in the world for a young, you know, young young person, and uh, it was really a great experience. Well, I think since that time they seem to get a little bit younger with each administration. I think by W. Bush it was a 24, 25 year old who had that. Uh, yeah, I one think of Jenna's uh, ex-boyfriends, as I recall. Yeah, that's right. I think. Uh, I don't know, I must have been 28 or 29 when I took that job or something like that. And, what uh, was it like? With Ford? Yeah. Oh, it was a great job. I mean, you know, um, uh, you, uh, it was extremely challenging because you had to bring, arrange all the internal events, you know, and the Rose Garden events and keep things on track, introduce him, you know, when he would go out to a Rose Garden event, uh, oftentimes, or bring people into the office, your ceremonial events, you'd have to introduce him to the right people, get all these names straight in your mind instantaneously. Uh, the assassination, you know, was right on his shoulder at both assassination attempts uh, in California. You know, so it was an extraordinary uh, couple, of, uh, couple of years. It was a very fine man to work, work with, a man that grew enormously uh, uh, throughout his uh, uh, tenure uh, as president, and I think would have been a uh, superb second term president had he been elected, and that was a very close election. Courageous guy, I think, made the right decision on the pardon, you know, which uh, took great political heat for doing, but it was no qu absolutely the right thing to do. I found it fascinating that the Kennedy uh, Award should come to uh, Ford for uh, making a profile and courage for making that decision to pardon Richard Nixon. But it would have been uh, horribly bad for the uh, for the country uh, had he not done that. I think, and had that that lingered, and uh, it, it would have been a terrible precedent and a very bad thing. Uh, he made some. Uh, President Ford made some bad political decisions uh, from time to time. Although he may have been right on the policy issues, uh, you know, the, the Russian, the Soviet grain embargo, things of that nature, which cost him conservative support. Um, but uh, 
really was uh, dedicated to uh, to uh, the country and a real patriot in the way he approached the uh, hi hi the job. Uh, very honest and uh, you know very high integrity uh, uh, gentleman. So it was uh, it was a real honor to work for him in that capacity. And there is no job in the world like that because you're kind of the shadow to the President of the United States, so you, you're with him everywhere he goes, as I said. And what you see and learn, I mean, how, do, how could you possibly, you know, there's no degree, no training uh, that you could imagine that could approach that opportunity. So it was really a wonderful uh, opportunity. I was very honored to be, uh, have, that, uh, have that time with him uh, in, the, in the White House, as I was with President Nixon and that staff. I learned so much in those years. I said it's a, every young American should aspire to, you know, to get into government and to work in the White House at some point in their life. I mean, obviously, it's small, so many, not many people can. But I think, uh, from the interviews that you've conducted, uh, uh, it's a highlight of the life of, of so many people. You know, to to be able to work there and to. Participate in the uh, in the uh, unfolding of uh, government and governance at that level. Really, a great opportunity. You've worked with four remarkable chiefs of staff. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What's your from your experiences? What does a good chief of staff do? What do they bring to the table? Because you are also there. During the you have Barry Worth's uh, book on your bookshelf, so I'm thinking about this. Uh, the 31 days is also a 31 days in which you do have the hub and spokes and right. uh, the uh, the access that you were talking about. Right, right. When the Ford administration began reestablishing order, you know, how did the role of chief of staff evolve there? And and then again, more generally, what does yeah. a good chief of staff bring to the table? You know, after the election. Uh, when Carter was elected, but before the end of the administration, we had a dinner, and um, Red and I, we presented uh, Don Rumsfeld with this uh, bicycle wheel. Uh, Red may have told you this, with mangled bicycle wheel with the spokes all going this way and that way. <laughs> and we presented it to Don as the, you know, the, the spokes of the wheel of management theory, and Don took great offense at that in a humorous way, because he said, that wasn't my doing, you know. And, and uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, you know, between Haldeman and, and Haig and Rumsfeld and Cheney, really uh, four very, very interesting and accomplished people approaching the job, uh, each one a little differently. But a, my take, and I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but my take is that a good chief of staff is, is selfless, wholly dedicated to the president's mission and president's message is a um, excellent manager and team builder uh, because that's what the White House is. You know, it's a big team, and you've got to manage that team and build that team in order to accomplish the ends. Uh, the person has to be has to see around corners, has to be almost uh, clairvoyant uh, to be effective. You know, because problems come in over the transom every day. You've got to be a terrific firefighter, but you've got to be a lot more than that. You've got to focus on the long-term goals, mission, image, appearance, and the success of the administration, protecting America's interests, protecting uh, our commercially as well as uh, you know economic and military interests, uh, and help the president accomplish all those ends. You've got to work with the cabinet. The chief of staff has to be able to rein in cabinet members who are off the reservation for whatever reason. Um, staff members, it's a little easier to rein in, but sometimes that's not so easy either. I was uh, just reading in Peter Rodman's book about the morning when President Ford dismissed Director Colby and Secretary Schlesinger. Right, right, right. So the Chief of Staff really has to help the President do all those things. And when you think about it, um, if, if you look at a well-run corporation, uh, I'm general counsel and uh, executive vice president of Textron, and we're about a $12 billion corporation, and we have um, 
processes that are developed over a long time, financial processes, internal controls, staff processes, and, and when you think about this is not a $12 billion corporation, this is America. This is, this is the most powerful nation in the country, and you throw together uh, at, the, at, at each election a team, you know, it, which has to rediscover processes or career people there to pass on certain good best practices, but otherwise this team has to rediscover processes. It has to blend together. It has to work together. It has to get stuff done right out of the, right out of the block, and that's a daunting task. That's a big task, and the chief of staff is critical in getting that done. Good talent across the board is, 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 is also uh, absolutely critical, but the chief of staff is, is the guy that, uh, the, the person that really brings it all together you got to deal with a national security advisor down the hall, you know. I mean, with Bob and Henry, you know, and I saw a, a lot of that, you know. There was uh, keeping, you know, Henry Kissinger was a very brilliant person. He was a demanding person, and uh, uh, he had very strong views, and all of that had to be coordinated. And, uh, you know, that's... Just think about the relationships that the chief of staff has to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, I, I would say it's, you know, other than being the president who has to stand up there and deliver these, these comments and these messages, it's the toughest job uh, that I know of. I, I can't imagine any job in industry, in government, in education, anywhere that's, that can hold a candle to that job. Uh, and um, I, I do believe that a very disciplined White House process is necessary. I, I do believe that the President is well served by uh, avoiding ad hoc uh, submission of data and information. Stuff that comes to the President should be fully staffed and, and candidly staffed. The, the, the Chief Staff has to be a, uh, a neutral broker in this regard. He may have strong views about the way he would like to see this issue decided, but he has the staff secretary process to ensure that the other cabinet members who feel differently, that their points of view are in that memo, and that that memo represents a fair description of the pros and cons of this, of this initiative, and then the president can act on it appropriately. President Ford liked to uh, do uh, uh, a little more in, in, the, in the personal sense, you know, the personal debate. He would have the uh, budget reconciliation appellate meetings with Jim Lynn, Paul O'Neill in the uh, cabinet room and we'd bring in the, the aggrieved cabinet member who lost out on a budget issue and the president would sit there like the Supreme Court <laughs> and give him a chance to argue, you know. That, that's good, I think, uh, but it's time consuming. I, I don't think you can beat a really well-staffed memorandum and then the president can elect who he wants to hear from on top of that. and. Um, uh, that process to produce that kind of work product, it, it isn't easy. And mm -hmm. I think the White House staff and the Chief of Staff ultimately are responsible for delivering that to the President. I don't know how you get it done. I mean, there's just, there's just endless stuff that has to be done in a day at the White House. And so uh, those people have to be remarkably talented. President Nixon writes in his memoirs, especially in Six Crises, the first volume, um, about tough decisions and what he'd learned. And you observed President Ford making some tough decisions of his own. Uh, I mentioned Schlesinger and Colby. There's also uh, partitioning Kissinger's job, giving the National Security Advisor to Brent Scowcroft and you know, stripping Kissinger of his White House role, um, asking Nelson Rockefeller to stand down from the ticket, mm -hmm. and then conducting a grueling primary campaign and then a grueling general election campaign. Mm -hmm. How did President Ford make a tough decision? How did he make the Schlesinger decision or the Kissinger decision or the Rockefeller decision? Uh, yeah, those are, th those are really quite different decisions, but in the, in the case of choosing a vice president, uh, 
obviously was very personally involved and, and, and conducted some interviews and we arranged to secrete some people in and out of the White House, you know, to, to, to meet with the President uh, using the Treasury Tunnel and other, other devices, <laughs> you know, because the press was all over it. Um, kind of hard to sneak Ronald Reagan in the front door, I right, imagine. Right, right, right. But um, he, um, he didn't hesitate to make a decision. Uh, he, was, he was pretty darn decisive with President Ford. And um, he, he had a little bit of a stubborn streak, too. Uh, and uh, sometimes he would, uh, he would say, this is the way I want to go. And very strong advisors might disagree with him. He'd stick to his position and, and say, we're going to do it this way, you know, and he would do it. He, 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 he really, to his credit, I suppose, although he's also the leader of the party and getting elected is very important, but to his credit in many respects, he uh, oftentimes disengaged or delinked the political aspects of some of the things that he did. Um, and by that I mean, you know, when you, when you look back, in hindsight, it's so clear, but when you look back, I mean, Nelson Rockefeller <coughs> may not have been the, the wisest choice politically. Nelson Rockefeller was an energetic uh, governor who loved policy and who loved government action, government activity, you know, and constantly came into the president's office with proposals uh, for domestic initiatives of one kind or another. Um, but politically, you know, he probably wasn't the, the, the very best uh, decision. And of course, that led to the awkward situation which occurred, you know, prior to the convention when the president went another direction. And um, that was a difficult, uh, that was not a, uh, you know, a smooth transition there. Um, you know, when he did, when he did uh, things like, uh, you know, the grain embargo, which angered the farm states, that was not politically, uh, was not good politics. May have been good foreign policy, may not, I don't know. But, but it wasn't good politics. And um, a lot of people were on the other side of that issue, substantively, not just politically. So uh, he was, um, uh, he, he didn't have his eye on the political uh, issues, particularly in the beginning of the administration, anywhere near as much as, uh, as one might think, you know. Um, I don't know when in his own mind he was convinced that he was going to run, but I suspect it was earlier than, way earlier. I, I suspect once he was in there, he said, you know, I'm, I'm going to take a shot at it. And uh, could have could have laid the political groundwork, uh, I think, better by making other decisions, chose not to, made the decisions he thought were the right decisions at the time. So um, I'm not going to say he wasn't aware of the political consequences at all, but he wasn't focused on them, and, and he, he put him in a secondary position in, in many, of the, many of the decisions that he made. Just a few last questions, and we can return you to your... Sure. Yes. Okay. Um, what was Governor? Uh, what was President Ford's reaction when he heard that Governor Reagan was definitely running against him? Oh, I think um, I don't think it came as any surprise. I, I uh, despite some of the things that have been written, uh, I think it was pretty apparent to him that Governor might Governor Reagan might well run. Uh, he was um, uh, his view was. Um, you know, he thought he was doing a good job as president, and he thought he could earn that nomination, and so he would win. Uh, he was concerned about the, about having a uh, very divisive fight within the party, uh, but not worried about it in the sense that he thought it could heal, at least initially, and it never really did heal. I, I think that's uh, that. Uh, was one of the factors in the election in, in 1976 is that I think uh, the split that occurred in that, that rousing convention, you know, I mean, half the delegates there were for Ronald Reagan and they were, they were loud and they were going to be heard from, you know, I mean, it was that close, it was almost 50-50 there. So I, th I think that um, it did not mend as quickly as, as possible. I, there are a lot of reasons for that, uh, but um, 
uh, I think that he was aware that it was costing them in September and October the, the lack of really hard charging enthusiastic support from the, the con more conservative wing of the party was an anchor to him and he was aware of that and tried to address it but you know it was a it was a pretty hard fought campaign sometimes it takes time and you don't have enough time for the party to come back together again sometimes it comes right back you know it's hard to say why but um, right 76 the Republicans fracture a little bit but 2008 the Democrats seemed to come back yeah they did in a very they similar did. situation they did they did I think um, I think the uh, the opponents got on board. I think the Reagan, the conservative movement, had very deep belief. Does is based on very deep beliefs, and I consider myself a conservative. You know, I, I think uh, there was distrust from the conservative movement in certain respects for President Ford for a number of things that. Uh, that uh, we talked about the grain embargo, Henry Kissinger, and some of his initiatives. Mrs. Ford was very outspoken, and the president, you know, encouraged her outspokenness. He did not try to to restrain or, or muzzle her. So there was distrust on the uh, on the conservative side toward Ford, and that did uh, cost him uh, some support. Could have made a difference, maybe not. Who knows? Uh, when the election day came, and. Uh, uh, I think on, in the Obama case here, the uh, the opponents in the uh, in the primaries came together pretty effectively, you know, and uh, uh, so I think there was a much quicker healing. Remember, initially the Hillary troops, you know, were pretty darn mad, and they weren't going to, and then but she led them to that conclusion, and it came together, you know, and uh, so. Fascinating, isn't it? <laughs> you were, I, I, you were almost always at the president's side. Um, president Ford has two assassination attempts. Right. What are those like? Yeah, they were um, uh, remarkable. One, uh, the uh, first, uh, we were on our way to a meeting with uh, Jerry Brown in uh, Sacramento at the Capitol, and we were working a crowd line and. Um, there's an agent immediately in front. There's a rope and barrels on the left, agent in front, agent on the side, agent behind him. I mean, shoulder to shoulder. And then I'm between the two agents, the side and the, and the back. And the president can't accept anything. So I get envelopes and gifts, and I put them in my briefcase so that they're all responded to properly and so forth. And then I'm keeping my eye on the clock and watching when I need to pull him away from the line to get him to the meeting. And I saw this uh, woman with strange eyes, I can still blink and see those eyes, and she was uh, just back in the second uh, level behind the ropes and barrels. It was Squeaky Fromm from the Manson family, and uh, I, I locked on her because she was, uh, she was uh, a frightening image. I mean, she was really bizarre. And the next thing I know, her hand's coming up. Larry Boondorf grabbed the gun and cut his hand, came up with such force. Gun shout, you know, gun, collapsed the president on the ground, all clear, got up, and double time the rest of the way. You know, we double time right into the uh, Capitol. President did this, walked right into the meeting room on that floor, sat and said hello to the governor and his staff and sat down. The governor didn't know what had happened. And then one of his staff members came in and whispered to the governor, and the governor nearly turned white. Are you okay, Mr. President? <laughs> and, you know, it was just like that. I mean, it was unbelievable. And the Secret Service said, you, you know, you're not going to go back to Northern California. Uh, the president said, no, we're going back. And so it was just a month later, give or take, that we were in San Francisco and Sarah Jane Moore. I had ridden down the elevator from the speech in the hotel, told the president that the agent said, go straight to your car because there was a lot of demonstrators out there. Don't work the the lines uh, just outside the hotel. No security threat. I mean, just mean crowd there in, Northern, in San Francisco. And so we're walking out the door, and I saw the flash of the gun across the street, and you can see the quick photos. I'm ducking, and then, and then the agents start to collapse him. The bullet went right over my shoulder and hit the hotel wall. 
and they collapse the president, throw him into the car like a log, and jump in on top of him, and the mo motorcade peels out of town. And you know, I didn't have warm feelings about Northern California as a result of those two incidents. I'll tell you. Or but, I'm uh, I'm interviewing James Falk on Tuesday, and he had the famous quote about San Francisco. It's oh yeah, the, the coop ca coop <laughs> capital of yeah uh, yeah yeah. yeah. So, Probably uh, didn't help with the uh, with the election up there. No, no. Well, <laughs> you know, it was. Uh, but twice in you know, seventeen days, I think. Yeah, whatever it was, it was less than a month. That's just amazing, you know, just an amazing event. But uh, yeah, I saw those, <laughs> and I can still, as I said, I can still blink and see Squeaky from there. I mean, she was a scary lady, uh, no question about it. Then, of course, I read the Manson family story and so forth and understood why, you know, I mean, that was a bizarre chapter. But, uh, but what else? Anything else that I can address for you? Or? One last thing, and um, this is a relationship that comes out of your time in the Ford administration, but it's continued, uh, I believe, down to the present day. And um, I don't want to ask about anything you've done in private practice, but you worked very closely with, uh, with Vice President Cheney in the Ford White House. And uh, as DOD counsel and you know let me just choose a question you know, the, the many questions I have and we never enough time to ask all of them um, when he was at defense very challenging time um, how did you work with the secretary yeah he had uh, when John Tower had confirmation problems uh, George Bush 41 picked Cheney as you know and he was confirmed in record time. And uh, he asked me uh, immediately thereafter to come on board as general counsel of the Department of Defense, which I was uh, very happy to do. I grew up in the military, loved the department. And um, it is, by the way, the best legal job in government. I take it over attorney general. It is a fabulous job because the Department of Defense is global and it's so complicated. It has more lawyers than the Department of Justice. and. Um, so uh, I um, uh, was uh, his legal advisor, uh, as well as head of the legal services for the department, and uh, you know attended. The, I was on his uh, uh, little steering committee with the uh, with the service secretaries, and I attended uh, um, you know many many of the critical meetings uh, leading up to the Gulf War and so forth with him and advised him on international law and and day-to-day um, -day legal issues of the department uh, fortunately there were not huge numbers that I needed to bring to the secretary because you have the deputy secretary and then I could resolve an awful lot of stuff on my own and uh, so we had a great working relationship during that period of time I, I found him to be extraordinarily effective um, Secretary of Defense and uh, I think his uh, stewardship of the uh, first Gulf War and you know the Panama incursion and some of the other things that occurred during that time to be uh, flawless really in their execution um, he, um, he had so much experience when he took that job from the White House from his private endeavors and from the congressional leadership position that he had been in that I think he was well suited to be Secretary of Defense and he understood international and global things quite well. So uh, he, he was very good and a great client. I mean he always, I had complete access, he would always listen, may not always agree with me but uh, uh, and use me as a sounding board on non-legal, uh, you know, policy issues and non-legal things whenever he felt like doing it. Always learning, always a great appetite for learning. On Saturdays we would have these seminars that uh, uh, Scooter Libby would uh, and Paul Wolfowitz would do where we would have professors from uh, you know maybe a couple of CIA specialists in one area and a couple of guys from academia would come in and we'd have a, sem a, a seminar and discussion on a Saturday morning and I got to attend some of those. They were terrific, you know, but he would devote his Saturday just to stepping back and looking at a big issue, uh, whether it's the Middle East or whether it's, you know, developments in China, Soviet, you know, military, uh, whatever, and of course the wall 
you know, came down during that period of time. Um, so he, he, he was um, A plus secretary, really good to work with. Is there anything that you'd like to put on the record that we haven't covered? No, I don't think so. I mean, I, um, I, I, I'm so fortunate to have worked in the, uh, in, for President Nixon way down, way down the staff, but to be a member of that staff, I have such a high regard for uh, the staff members who, who worked for him uh, from Bob Haldeman on down. Uh, they were a very effective, uh, diligent group, and they did great things for America. And unfortunately, you know, the Watergate thing uh, has, uh, uh, and I think maybe even more history will help to separate these things, but Watergate has become such a huge theme in the eyes of, of a couple of generations of Americans that uh, it has clouded uh, an awful lot of the accomplishments uh, of, of the Nixon administration. Uh, you know, whether it be China or, the, or his environmental initiatives, people don't realize, you know, that he was the one, good, bad, or indifferent, he's the one who established the Environmental Protection Agency and very innovative, creative man and, uh, you know, a man uh, demanding uh, uh, terrific respect for the service that he performed in the country. So to be on that staff was a huge privilege. Um, so I think that's it. I mean, that's all I would, that's all I would have to say. Mr. O'Donnell, thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome.